Our next speaker is, is uh, Emory's own Kelsey Shaw. All right. Thank you all so much for sticking with us uh, in this last session that I think should be called Really Cool Study Systems. Uh, so I'm here today to talk to you about how body size can scale schistosome transmission from individuals to communities. So I think what we've heard throughout this conference is that host heterogeneity can really impact disease transmission and that can have a real scaling effect. So traits that individuals have, of course, can vary at the population level with implications for disease transmission and prevalence. And community interactions in your ecological community have the potential to feed back on those traits with consequences for disease. And I like to examine these ideas in the snail schistosome system. Schistosomes are parasitic flatworms that infect human and livestock worldwide and cause a neglected tropical disease, schistosomiasis. They have a complex life cycle in which they obligately cycle between mammalian and snail hosts. But in our lab, and for the purposes of this talk, we're gonna focus all on the snail side of things. And so um, on that side of the life cycle, we have a free living life stage that enters, seeks out and enters its snail host, reproduces within it, and then emerges as another free living life stage that seeks out the human host. And so in this system, it turns out that body size is a really key trait. What we see at the individual level is that body size can impact exposure and susceptibility, which then when you're looking at different populations of snails that have different size structures, has a potential to impact transmission. And the greater ecological community through mechanisms such as competition and predation may in fact be feeding back on this individual trait of body size, all of which can come back to human risk of disease. And so this talk is going to serve, um, this slide is going to serve as a bit of an outline for the talk to anchor these ideas, because I'm going to basically be doing a really quick drive-by at every scale here. And so we're going to start with the individual scale. All right, so what we know in these snails is that the larger a snail is, the greater its exposure rate to parasites, presumably because the free living life stage is able to seek out a larger host more easily in the water. However, on a per-parasite basis, the larger you are, the less susceptible you are to successful infection by those parasites. And this is a relationship that has been worked out quite a while ago, um, although with uh, small kind of sample sizes and different, um, very small and very large snails. And so we spent quite a lot of time, um, or I've spent quite a lot of time, really refining this relationship. And just as an example of some of the data we look at, uh, here are data from an experiment in which we were able to fix exposure um, and just look at that susceptibility part of this equation. And we saw indeed that with increasing body size, um, we saw decreasing prevalence across you know, a range of infections. And so, okay, given that you accept that this is happening with one snail in one cup, um, what does that matter then at the population level where we have the potential to have different size structures in different water bodies or different regions in which schistosomes are important? And it's easy to look here at this schematic and see you know, a little cartoon small snail and a big snail next to each other, uh, but I think it really drives it home to look at just a random photo I literally pulled up on my computer from one of my experiments where you can see that we have very tiny snails about half a millimeter that live in the same population with very large snails up to 25 millimeters. So we have a big range of this heterogeneity and then we can also see very different size structures between different tanks or water bodies. And so in order to think about how this impacts transmission, I wanted to take both an empirical and a theoretical approach. And so on the experimental side, um, we did some transmission trials in which I tested a range of different population size structures. But again, for time today, we're just going to talk about a few. And so we're going to think today about a population that has uniformly small snails, all very small individuals, compared to one that has an equal ratio of small to medium to large snails, and one that's skewed towards smaller snails but still has some medium and large individuals present. And we conducted transmission trials across a few different parasite levels to see how this played out. At the same time, we wanted to use these data to build a size explicit transmission model which had been lacking in the system so far. So I won't go into the details of the model, but the crux of it really just boils down to taking the transmission term, breaking it into exposure and susceptibility, and playing with them in a very simple way across snail size. So we looked at a size independent null model doesn't matter how big a snail is. And then we also looked at models in which we allowed exposure to vary with snail size, 
susceptibility to vary, or the most exciting one in my opinion where we allow both exposure and susceptibility to vary with snail body size. So if we take a look at the experimental results, here you'll see on the x-axis a few different parasite levels, and on the y, the prevalence we saw in these snail populations at that population level. And what we saw is that as you add in a greater ratio of bigger snails to the population, you saw a lower prevalence across all parasite levels. And so that's really cool and kind of makes sense given the fact that you know, the more bigger snails you have, the less susceptible they are. However, the really interesting part, I think, is if you zoom in on just the small snails in each of these tanks, since they did all contain some small snails at least, what you see is that the larger snails can sort of act as a shield towards their smaller neighbors. So smaller snails experienced a lower prevalence, again, in these tanks that had the larger individuals. Um, and so that can only be explained by these larger individuals having that greater exposure rate, sort of potentially attracting parasites away from their small neighbors, but then those infections not successfully uh, proceeding. So this is a really exciting finding. It was something I talked about for a couple years as maybe happening, and we finally got to see it experimentally, which was cool. Um, but then we took these data, like I said, and we wanted to fit them to our models. And first, just to show the size independent model here, you can see that it has no ability to change with our different size structured populations. It has no flexibility there, and it overall fits the data quite poorly. Uh, compared to our favorite fully size dependent model, we see a much better fit to data, and we can you know, change it as we feed it different population size structures. And again, that fully size dependent model, when we competed it against all four that I talked about, really kind of blew the others out of the water. Okay, so given that size structure is important, and we really think it is, what is driving that? You know, these snails live in complex ecological communities, and what are some of the things that might be changing size structures as we look in different areas? Well, to look at this, um, I did a mesocosm experiment to test the effects of community composition on size structure. So I had many, many mesocosms, or uh, fake lakes, um, into which I had populations in which there were just host snails, as well as others that had host snails and non-host competitor snail species. So these other snails cannot get infected with schistosomes, but do compete with the host snails for resources. Um, and if you're curious, the host snail is this little orange one, Baumfilaria, and I had a few different competitor species. We collected a lot of data over four months. Um, and again, I don't have time to go into all the details, but I really just want to focus on what we found with the snail abundance and body size structure shifting over time and just zooming in on one of these competitors that we found really interesting. So here we're looking at just our host snail population. So snails that weren't put in with any other competitors, they only had hosts in the tank. And on the x-axis, we have time and week. And on the y, we have host abundance. What we saw is that our host snails that were just with themselves, um, we seeded them at relatively low uh, abundances into the tanks, and they had a reproductive burst pretty early on in the experiment, uh, but then the, you know, those large amounts of individuals were competing with resor for resources over time and kind of settled out at a lower abundance. However, if you look at the host abundance in tanks where the hosts had competitors present, you see that this reproductive burst doesn't happen to nearly the same degree. So sure, you have some juveniles entering the population at roughly the same time um, as our host-only tanks, but really at a much lower level. However interesting, they end up at a pretty similar abundance. But if you take um, a zoomed-in look at each of these dots to say, okay, but what is the size structure happening at all these times, since that's what I've hopefully been driving home to is the really interesting part, here we're going to examine that. We're going to have snail size on the X here. And then note that for each graph, the Y is host abundance, but these scales vary greatly. Uh, it's really the only way to visualize these data altogether, but just kind of make a mental note to check out the Y scale on each one. But again, we seeded these tanks with a few sort of mid-sized adults who began to grow in the experiment and then quite quickly reproduced. And then here at week six, we see this big reproductive burst. And then those juveniles get recruited into the population and grow over time. Um, however, in tanks, again, where we have our competitor present, but we're looking just at those host snail dynamics, we see a different trend. So if you look up at that week six, you see that uh, where we're lacking that big abundance of juveniles entering the population in this blue host plus competitor treatment, 
the size structure at that time really isn't that different from these tanks that are host only. There are still juveniles entering, just far fewer of them. However, interestingly, then over time, that plays out into different size structures over the rest of the experiment as all these other dynamics come into play. Um, so we found that you know, both reproduction and competition were shaping these dynamics. There's also a really interesting uh, integral predation punchline story that I don't have time to get into, but I'm happy to talk about afterwards as well. So I think you know, a lot of this boils down to it's really complicated, and then you add in an endemic transmission setting, such as this one. Uh, this is a water body near Mwanza, Tanzania, where we do a lot of field work. And you can imagine all the ecological complexity happening just under the surface of this water. And so um, my goal for the rest of my work is to work with our greater team in these sites. Um, in these over 100 water bodies, we have um, collaborators who do snail surveys every month looking at host snail abundance, size structure, schistosome prevalence, um, schistosome shedding levels, and then they also look at the presence and absence of competitor host snails. And the piece I'm hoping to bring in is looking at predators, uh, such as this lovely little crab here, um, and looking at their abundance and diversity within and across these water bodies, as well as their size selectivity for predation and how that can be shaping some of these dynamics as well. And so just to wrap up, today we talked about how changes in exposure and susceptibility at the individual level can uh, influence a snail's chance of being infected, and how that then plays out to these population level transmission dynamics. And finally, how community interactions can really shape these things and feedback on that individual host trait. Thank you so much to everyone um, in the lab, as well as our collaborators in Tanzania at the National Institute for Medical Research, as well as all of the undergraduates uh, that helped contribute to this work. You got to see all of their pictures on various slides. And with that, I'll take questions. Thank you, Kelsey. We have time for a few questions. slow run across the room. <laughs> um, that was a great talk. Thank you so much. Um, I was curious, you've really outlined some compelling pieces around you know, com the community. I wonder if you thought about or looked at or found any um, relationship in thinking about like external disturbances. I'm wondering if like across the landscape, if you've got like these human mediated impacts on various water bodies, if that's then actually, if you're seeing differences in schistomyces prevalence that might be mediated, mediated anthropologically. And I was curious if you were aware of any work or had looked into that at all. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a, a gold mine of work that you know, 20 people could be working on. For my own work, um, it's really interesting. Some of these competitors that I'm uh, looking at were introduced by people, either unintentionally or intentionally, trying to um, modulate schistosome dynamics and were either successful or not. So that's a whole kind of historical backstory that I'm you know, landing at these water bodies with. Um, and then other people in our lab look at other types of human um, impacts, such as resource pulses you know, from farming nearby. Uh, Linda Bradley in my lab does that work. So definitely a few people are coming at it from different angles there. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah. That was a great talk, really interesting. Um, I was just wondering, with the different schistosome species that, may, that affects human populations differently or animal populations, do, are there any differences in sort of preference or uh, ability to invade snails, or do you, is it the same pattern across all of the schistosome species? Oh, so um, like how do the different schistosome species, how does it play out with these dynamics? Or Yeah, so most of the lab work is done in the biome filaria schistosoma mansoni system. So schistosomes, um, there's several different species that we care about. Um, and it's kind of a, a schistosome species snail genera level relationship. Um, and in our lab, we also work with that Baumfilaria mansoni system. They're much more tractable. Uh, in the field here in Tanzania, we have both Baumfilaria mansoni, and then we also mostly are looking at Belinus and Hematobium, so slightly different flavor. And there's absolutely potential differences um, in how important these dynamics are, or sort of what is the greatest driver in these different systems. Um, and we don't even touch an, the other most common one in people, which is Japonicum. <laughs> awesome. Thank, Thank you, you again for that fascinating talk.